Hog Money, your guide to the economy of Bermuda. Welcome back to Hog Money, and it's been a fun time so far, and we've still got two segments to go. Uh, right now, what we want to move into is the area of mindset. Now, in terms of financial assistance and this whole topic about whether or not it hinders or it helps able-bodied people, there are definitely two sides to this, and there are two mindsets. And we could say there's a mindset, one, between haves and have-nots, because I think that there is a different mindset there as well. Because there are most people who, who, have, who are successful and who have, most successful people I've spoken to feel like it's about working hard, you know? And then some people I find that maybe who, who haven't been as successful in life feel that maybe they need a handout. And it's funny that Dr. Braun had said, Dr. Braun has warned that Bermuda will become a welfare state unless people stop relying on the government to do everything for them, you know? And he was the you know, leader of the, the labor government and he said that. And he says, once again, we have to be careful of Bermuda turning into a welfare state. The government can't, the government can't do everything. It can't wake you up in the morning. So hence, there, there's definitely a mindset here. Uh, there's a line that, and, and I don't know, maybe you guys can, you, you, can, you can add to this, but where is that line that says, look, this person could do more <coughs> with their self? You know, where do you say that? Where do you say this able-bodied person is not doing enough? They can do something with their life. They, have, they, can, they can do it. They can work hard and they can get it. Like I worked hard and, and got it. Well, I, I think first of all, um, I don't agree with the notion that people are simply saying government owes me something, government has to do this. Mm -hmm. um, I, my argument is that uh, government should help those who need a helping hand mm -hmm. uh, to, the, to the extent that they can uh, get back on their feet. Um, I think uh, maybe um, persons who who start, uh, who seek uh, employment, who get something low, uh, see the opportunity to better themselves, and then they do better themselves. But I don't think there's this notion out there that the government should be doing everything for you. I mean, the, you have the businesses on the one hand uh, asking government for concessions and this. Mm -hmm. I remember mm -hmm. there's one um, uh, lawyer working for one of the department stores is saying don't feed the beast in terms of the uh, civil service but yet the, the company they represented were asking for government concessions so you have welfare on that side too so no the government shouldn't be doing everything not only for its people but not also for the businesses as well which we tend to forget in this whole argument right so that's the thing is it is it is it really like a cancer you know is it is it is it even spread into businesses who feel that you know, they should be getting something. Like, does this spread? And, and in that mindset, if you, have a, if you have a child that's growing up in a household that, 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 is, that is living in, in, this, in this environment, do you think there could be any learned behavior there? Well, I think if you have, uh, uh, children are obviously gonna learn based on what they see. Um, and so, uh, yes, there's certainly going to be learned behavior, uh, whether they're picking up on, on this, I can do it for nothing and I can get money, or I see my parents struggling, I see them going out to, to work and doing three jobs and they're not getting ahead. You see a lot of that as well. So yeah, there is that learned behavior, but I think what happens is, you know, how does that person or that child internalize that and how do they replay that back later in life? Again, there's a lot of myths about welfare. One of them is this myth about dependency. I mentioned this earlier that the, the data in the social science literature is just not there. Mm -hmm. The two-generation worklessness is only 0.9% in the UK. Mm -hmm. The three-generation worklessness is only 0.1%. Now, you brought up that individual story about that, that friend of yours who went on benefits and he just stopped trying. That's one I didn't say there was a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. I didn't say there was a friend of mine, <laughs> but I'm just <laughs> Go ahead. But, uh, social scientists have also done a lot of qualitative research. Uh, I'm basing from UK research here, and mm -hmm. they've done a lot of these interviews with people who are on benefits, mm -hmm. and they just haven't found that to be the case. The majority of people who are on benefits, they want to work, they have a strong work commitment, and like uh, Bob said, it's not just about wages, it's about a sense of self-esteem and doing something, being productive. So there is that. So this idea of uh, being on benefits makes you dependent and not wanting to try, that mindset is it's a myth. It doesn't exist. It's a myth perpetrated by people who are opposed to a welfare system for whatever ideological reason. Well, <coughs> now, another thing you brought up was mm -hmm. the 
matter of hard work and ambition. Mm -hmm. That all you need is hard work and ambition and you can succeed. Mm -hmm. That's about social mobility or class mobility. Mm -hmm. The research that exists says that does not exist. Mm -hmm. People are poor because they're born poor. People are rich because they're born rich. <laughs> there is some mobility. There's always an exception to the rule. But for I've got some American data here. 70% mm -hmm. of those born into the bottom 20% of that income bracket, they stay in that their entire life. Only about 20% get into the middle class. Only 10% can climb all the way from the bottom to the top. So there is that option. Now for the middle class, only 20% of the middle class can go up. That's what they're founding. This is going back about 40 years. Mm -hmm. Okay? The majority of the upper class people were born upper class. They've done research going back 700 years, and they found out that the economic elite, for 700 years long, it's being stable. There's no real social mobility. Mm. It does exist, but it's a minority of people who can do it. It's well, you know, poor well, I'm, born poor. I'm not, I'm not going to get dragged into the statistical norms, but if you look at people who are wealthy, as a general rule, there's a, an old aphorism, rags to rags in three generations, and you'll find that people who have been extremely wealthy, and, and going back into history, you look at people like Rockefeller, or Henry Ford, uh, all these guys basically came from nothing and they became very, very wealthy and they gave the money away, you know, as they got older and before they died. Although their, their children became reasonably successful, but the grandchildren, um, I bet you couldn't name a grandchild of Henry Ford who has been successful in this world. Or you can't name somebody, a grandchild of, or later from John D. Rockefeller who became successful. They just don't exist. They don't need but to because they already they, have the money. No, they, they don't. They, 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 <laughs> they don't they, have to work. They, they, actually, they actually lose their money over a period of time. No. And one of the most interesting uh, pieces of work you can read from time to time is the Fortune 400 richest people in the world. And you will find that the people who constantly come in from one year's end to the next are people who have been born poor. They haven't had a you know, they, they haven't had a silver spoon in their mouth. But let me let me just go on to another point. You know, very slight rather than argue about statistics. For roughly since mankind came onto this earth, people have looked after them, other people as well as themselves. You know, and it's worked extraordinarily well. You know, families, extended families have looked after, churches have looked after people, charities have looked after people. And this has been, you know, really a quite a successful mechanism whereby people are looked after. There is no recorded instance of somebody in the West, and I'm, I, when I say the West, I mean in the broadest term, including Japan and so on, there is no recorded instance of somebody in the last hundred years or so having died from starvation. If you go be before that date, you will find that there are repeated famines in countries which are now very wealthy in France, in UK and so on, there were famines and people did die of hunger. That just doesn't happen now. People do look after each other. And you know, the, can, uh, and, and, and the fact is, is the, the fact is, even the poorest person in society is much, much better off than one of the wealthy or middle class people were more than a hundred years ago. Hold on, what, gentlemen, you, you're just trying to say something. What, what are you trying to say to that? Well, there's, there's a few things. Uh, one thing, the, uh, the article that I'm quoting about the social mobility, it's in the New Yorker magazine called The Mobility Myth from last year. And it actually uh, mentioned Carnegie and I think Rockefeller. And it talked about how when they came in the late 19th century, yeah. the economic system was different and there was a greater degree of social mobility. But since, the post, since World War II, mobility has stalled. It's been at that rate which I've talked about. Yeah. Now, yes, you're right that, you know, the average poor person today in the Western world is better than uh, the rich person in the Western world 200, 300 years ago. The reason for that is we've outsourced a lot of this poverty to the third world through imperialism, which continues today. So yes, we're better, but we're only better because we're making other people worse. I have spent a large chunk of my working life in the third world, Guatemala, India, uh, Malaysia, you name it, South America. I've spent a lot of time there. And people who live in these countries have benefited from their uh, connections with the West. People who live in Brazil or Guatemala or India and so on are extremely well off. 
by comparison with uh, the, I, I the totally, people a few years ago. Totally disagree. Now, they're, they're, totally they're, not, disagree. they're not as wealthy as people who live in the United States or people who live in Europe, admittedly. But within, I would guess, within probably 50 years, people in China and India will be pretty well off and probably just as rich as people who live in the West. I, I, believe I, 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 I believe in Peter Pan, too. Yeah, but um, because the, I, I, the opportunity is there. Let me, let me say this. Uh, there is a, a friend of mine, a Bermudian, who uh, moved to Brazil, and I didn't realize, and he was back in Bermuda. And I said to him, so how are things? And I said, I haven't seen you in a while. And he says, oh, yeah, I've moved to Brazil. And I said, oh, that sounds exciting. Uh, what's that like? He says, well, you know, the people down there will never escape that poverty. They just never escape that poverty. Didn't uh, Jonathan just said 70% will stay there, right? It's very difficult to move up, especially if you want to keep wages low. Very difficult for people to move out of poverty. One thing uh, I should also add that in that uh, same the same article about social mobility, I found that uh, the greatest rates of social mobility actually exist in countries with the strongest, most robust welfare system. <laughs> so Sweden, for example, <laughs> Denmark, they've got great welfare systems, mm. and they have the largest amount of social mobility, okay. allowing the poor to get out of poor and into middle class or upper class. Now, even there, the rich people are still dominated by people who are born rich, but there's a greater degree of mobility because of the welfare system. So you're saying that, so you're, so are you, are you telling, are you saying that it, it's not just a mindset? Are you saying that, it, you know, it, it, it's a class system and, you know, it's very difficult for you to, to, to jump into a different class, even, even in Bermuda? Yes. Yeah, Bermuda's got huge levels of inequality. We're not uh, anywhere near as the inequality levels as you see in Brazil, but it's still great inequalities here. And that's a result of slavery, segregation, and continues to this day through inertia. We don't have segregation anymore, but we have the after effect of that, which we've never dealt with. And our class system is race-based simply because of that. Of course, there, you have poor, right, poor whites, and you have some very upper-class blacks, but for the majority of the class system in Bermuda, it's racial because of our racial history. It was possible for people to come here up until maybe the 70s. They could come, if you're of European descent, for example, mm -hmm. you could come to Bermuda, and you could come from a very working class background. And due to the particularities of Bermuda's economic system and colonial system at that time, they had greater social mobility than those who were born here. So you have working class white people come to Bermuda, and now they're in the upper class. Whereas well, I was a working class, class white person who came to Bermuda in the 60s, you know. And you know, you're all glad. And, and, no, and no, I'm sure why I am. But, <laughs> but, but, but no, 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 nobody gave me, you know, an, Absolutely. An, an no, easy, nobody an, gave an you easy, up a hand. An easy and pass to walk. No, no, I'm sure they didn't. No, they no, didn't. But you Let, have connections and you have white right privilege as well. Yeah. I, I, I never had a GCE until I was 26. I, I got my first degree. I had a master's I got at my 22. First, I got my first degree when I was 29 years old. Now, you know, I'm not saying that I had a deprived life because I haven't. Mm. I've had a very good life. Mm. But the fact was, I was not wealthy. I was at down the lower levels of society. And you know, many people in the same position as I have been, and many others, have come from very poor, very difficult backgrounds, and they have emerged. I mean, the guy who uh, started off with what was known as the Piggly Wiggly is now the marketplace. Uh, Portuguese guy, I can't remember his name offhand, who, who died for a reason. Yeah, Fernandes Perry. Mm -hmm. Fernandes Perry had no money. I mean, the, the, he was almost illiterate. And yet he built up one of the biggest businesses in Bermuda. Yeah, and one, I, of, I and one of the most successful businesses in Bermuda. And when he died, he, he gave away a large chunk of his money to charity. Well, I think what Jonathan uh, was saying, that a lot of that is built on white privilege. I mean, if you take a Nelson Hunt today, look how much trouble establishment has given him in terms of running his businesses. The amount of the credit that the banks won't give him, all kinds of things like that. Um, we haven't dealt with this whole issue of race and white privilege. And until, unless and until we deal with that, we're gonna still be talking about this from uh, but let me let me hands. cut let me cut let me cut in here because well, yeah, let me okay. let me cut in here because it's it it 
I think we're moving past the point here that there is a certain a certain mindset. Now the mind the mind is where it all starts, where the idea starts, where everything that happens starts. So I don't think we can totally move away from there's a certain poverty mindset in some people. Well, that's that, few that and is far stopping between. them. Yeah. You know, and it's stopping a lot of people. Because There's a degree of internalizing the myth that has been created since the 1980s about dependency and poverty and benefit fraud. People have listened to that because it's amplified in the media from America, from the UK. Our own media amplifies this myth about a benefit dependency culture in an underclass. It doesn't actually exist. There's no statistical data to back it up. But people are hearing that and they're internalizing that message. So you do hear people who are in poverty themselves who advocate that. You do hear it, but they're a minority. And going back to what you talked about, Fernand's Perry, I'm not saying there's no social mobility. I just said that 10% of the lower class can get to the upper class, but they are the exceptions that prove to the rule of the lack of social mobility in general. Well, I think you're wrong, but anyway. Well, that was, yeah, that one's, that one's off. That's, I think we're going to leave that one for another day. Um, I think it's a little bit of both. I think there is some mindset, and maybe there is some, some roadblocks, you know? Um, but we got one more segment to go through. It's been very exciting, gentlemen. I'm enjoying the, the discourse so far uh, for, our, our, I guess, our, you call our first official episode of Hug Money. Um, but we'll be right back after these messages.